I think when people watch 300, the key is to remember that this film adaptation is consistent with a long line of interpretation, whether it's novelists in the 19th century, or whether it's poets in the 17th or 16th or 12th century, or whether it's vase painters in the 4th or Herodotus in the 5th. Each person is trying to convey this wonderful event, a story of a few men that were willing to risk all for a larger Western concept of freedom and liberty. To secret Sparta, a king, our king, Leonidas! Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho! You know, the storyteller knows how to not ruin a good story with the truth necessarily. You know, he, he knows how to exaggerate a moment for dramatic purposes. And because you have these young Spartans listening, you basically have the excuse of it's their version of the Battle of Thermopylae that you're seeing. Certainly that story was told thousands of times before it was ever written down. Herodotus wrote it down way after the fact, you know? It wasn't like he was there watching, you know, with the pen going, oh, geez, huh? taking notes. Here's what Herodotus said happened. And then here's Frank Miller's adaptation in modern context. And then here's the movie of Frank Miller's novel derived from Herodotus, derived from Thermopylae. This is the filter of Frank movie. You know, here's history, go through Frank, this is what you got. I was walking around there, walking the hills and staring at the plaque and staring at this magnificent frieze and sculpture that was built by American Greeks. I felt transported. I didn't know it would hit me as emotionally hard as it did. But ever since I was a little boy, I'd been wanting to walk that land. The Spartans remain a mystery. They were completely a battle culture. They were absolutely dedicated to warfare. But at the same time, they had an absolute code of honor on, on what it meant to be Spartan. And it was cruel, it was very cruel. If a child was born sickly or deformed, the child was murdered. But out of this arose this heroic class that, that the world had never seen before. These are people who, from the age seven, trained for nothing other than war. All young boys were taken away from their mothers and put into a thing called the agogi. And the agogi was a system that tried to create the ultimate warrior. Everything the agogi did was geared towards turning these young boys into grown men who would fight and die for the city-state of Sparta. In the movie, I've edited it into its most brutal aspects, but there were parts of the agogi that I think are also interesting that to be the ultimate warrior, you, you had to learn music and dance and mathematics and philosophy. That, that combination created the ultimate warrior. When they were in the agogi, they were taught to think, to be very witty and sharp. They used to have to sit with their tutors and have these kind of raps, you know, to see who could be funnier. And actually, they took those skills with them when they went into war. They used to walk into war singing and, and dancing. And the other warriors uh, in the ancient world thought this was completely crazy. In that process of training, all this myth-making surrounded the nature of the ordeal, that they were taught how to go out on their own barefooted, live off the land, steal their food. And again, the idea was that this was going to be a hyper-militaristic male initiation of a small coterie of exceptional warriors. I came up with the story of the wolf as an allegory for the hot gates themselves. There's no historical evidence that he ever fought a wolf at all. I, I'm, I made it up out of whole cloth because I cheat. But I wanted to symbolize not only the structure of the Battle of Hot Gates, the way he, he, he traps the wolf in, in between walls of rock, but also to establish Leonidas as a, as a legendary hero, rather than just as what was probably a much more practical man. But I, I, I've never been accused of realism. And I, I never deserve to be. <laughs> well, I have to say, I don't think in the historical record we do know that there was anything particular that Leonidas did that uh, allowed him to be king. I think he was king because it was his hereditary right that, that he was king. And in fact, what had happened is that um, his half-brother, his elder half-brother, had gone mad and had died cutting himself to pieces, which is how Leonidas inherited the throne. So it's a slightly less heroic version than the one that you'll find in the film. But what 
what's interesting about the film, I think, is that there are elements of truth in there. They had to go through this ritual where they ran through a sanctuary and they had to steal something from an altar. And as they ran through the sanctuary to try and steal this particular object from the altar, they were whipped with rods uh, and with horse whips. And they had to do this about 50 times. So you can imagine the state that their bodies were in by the end of this exercise. So if Leonidas had had to go through uh, an operation like that and had come out alive, then of course he was somebody special. Leonidas was the king of Sparta, and his name means born of lion stock. So already when he was given his name at birth, a lot was expected of him. He was expected to be a great hero. And I'm sure that a connection was being made with Hercules, because the Spartans hero worshipped Hercules. They thought they were actually descended from the hero Hercules. And of course, Hercules slays lions. It's one of the things that he does. And so I wonder if by giving Leonidas the name, the descendant of lions, they're almost expecting Leonidas to be like a kind of superhero. Leonidas was a very practical man who simply worshipped Sparta and wouldn't take the insult of letting what they called barbarians to overcome Greece. The shocking scene where Leonidas shoves the messengers into the, into the well. This is Sparta! Is actually one that I, I kind of cheated on that because that actually happened 10 years earlier with a different king. But to me, it was a great way to reveal that the Spartans were different than the other Greeks. They lived by much more barbaric rules. It was blasphemy to kill a messenger. And to kill 30 of them was beyond blasphemy. But those were the Spartans. I think what you've got to remember about the ancient world 2,500 years ago is that there was not a country called Greece with a capital, Athens, which is what we've got in our heads. There were these very distinct, very idiosyncratic city-states, lots of them, groups of people who really hated one another. So the Spartans really hated the Athenians, for instance. And at this time, 2,500 years ago, the really big deal are the Persians, this great big Persian empire that sits in the eastern Mediterranean and glares out across at Greece. Xerxes is Leonidas's nemesis, is Leonidas's fate. Xerxes was the emperor, the ruler of the Persian Empire. And at this time, the Persian Empire occupied most of the known world. So it occupied the whole of the Middle East, parts of Pakistan and India. And Persia had Greece and the rest of Europe in its sights, which is why Xerxes decides to invade. Xerxes regarded himself as God. He was, he was revered as a God king and he believed that it was his destiny to conquer the world. This was a man with quite some personality issues. <laughs> Xerxes was an individual who had never been challenged in his life about anything. So when he and his father decide that they're going to invade Greece, that they're going to take over the rest of the world, then nobody puts their hands up and says, we don't think this is such a good idea. Talking! There's nothing that can stop us now! What you have in Sparta are two kings, and the kings are advised by five ephors. And these ephors generally are old men, and they tell the kings what it is that they think they should be doing for the good of the Spartan state. But the ephors were incredibly important to the Spartans, and I think it's interesting what Frank Miller's done with them in his comic book, because he's kind of got their essence. Everybody was always trying to work out what the ephors wanted the Spartans to do. They're always trying to second guess them. So the fact that in the comic book you've got these ephors, these kind of gnarled old guys who hold the future of the city-state in their twisted hand is a very good evocation of them. Sparta wages no war at the time of the Carnage. There's a question here, and that is, to what degree do the Greeks themselves predicate their war making on superstition or logic? And I think in the movie, there's a little bit of that tension that you have some ephors who represent a pre logical or a pre reason past. Well, the ancient Greeks were all very, very religious, but the Spartans were 
double religious. The Spartans were incredibly superstitious and the Spartan army would only move when a certain spirit called the Oracle told them they should go and fight. And the Oracle was a real person. She was a woman and she lived in a temple, in Apollo's temple in this place called Delphi up in the north of Greece. And she was a very old woman but she used to dress in virgin's clothes. And she'd sit over this fire and on the fire would be sprinkled seeds of henbane or laurel which are really hallucinogenic. I mean, this is not, not something you should try at home because if you burn them, you get really quite a, quite a high. So the oracle would sit over sniffing up uh, this hallucinogenic smoke and then she'd babble out stuff. And this is what the Spartans believed were messages from the spirit world. Honor the carnia. What happens in reality is that the oracle, this kind of crazy uh, spirited woman, tells the Spartans that they can only go and fight at Thermopylae if they're ready to suffer terrible losses and if their king is prepared to die. It is not a question of what a Spartan citizen should do, nor a husband, nor a king. Instead, ask yourself, my dearest love, what should a free man do? What I love about Leonidas is he is probably the most decisive character I've ever played. But in his moment of indecision, he needs backup. He needs a second opinion. He needs assurance. He looks both times to his wife. Gorgo was, by all accounts, brilliant. And she and Leonidas had what I suspect was more a partnership than a marriage. Gorgo's a great character. I mean, she's a great character, not just in the film, but in history. Um, and we know quite a lot about her because this guy called Herodotus, who was the father of history, was so impressed by her stories that he chose to write about her, which, which tells us that she was significant. Spartan women were special anyway. They were always supposed to be incredibly beautiful. Homer tells us that Sparta was Sparta Caligineca, the, the land of beautiful women. And Spartan women were beautiful because they were physically fit, because they were allowed to exercise, and also because they had a real sense of themselves. I mean, unusually in the ancient world, Spartan women were not repressed. They were considered incredibly potent. What does a realist want with this queen? What's certainly true is that Spartan women were really sexualized. They weren't afraid of using their sexuality as a weapon. Women, for instance, could choose who they slept with, which is really, really unusual in ancient society. And it was often said of Spartan women that they would do this in a political context, that they would sleep with men who they wanted to, to find out kind of political secrets from. So I think this is probably where the idea of Gorgo as, as, as using her sex for political purposes and, and to serve the state comes from. We don't know to what degree a Spartan woman could prance into the assembly hall and announce to male voters who were, remember, the only citizens were male, that she was going to do this and this and that. But the idea of emancipated strong women taking a part in politics is very Greek. Queen Gorgo was a formidable politician. Spartan women were trained to battle just like the men. Had Persia marched directly on Sparta, the last line of defense probably would have been Spartan women who could fight very, very well. Consider the fate of your women. Clearly, you don't know our women. I might as well have marched them up here, judging by what I've seen. When Spartan men went off to fight, it's absolutely certain that they could do so really confidently because they knew that their women were back at home, keeping the city-state going and supporting them as warriors because this is what Spartan women had been brought up to do, and they were taught to want their sons to die for the state. This wasn't a problem. So you find that when Spartan warriors are killed, the women don't mourn as they do everywhere else in the Greek world. The women smile because they know that their son has died for his cause, and his cause is dying for the Spartan city-state. Come back with your shield, or on it. Yes, my lady. The fact that Gorgo says to Leon Edison in the film, come back with your shield or honor, is absolutely appropriate because we know that this is what a Spartan woman said to her warrior husband in real historical terms. We also know that Leonidas said to Gorgo as he was leaving, marry a good man and have good children because he knew he was never going to come back. A lot of the dialogue that's in this film 
is derived for the most part from Herodotus. When you hear warnings about the multitude of Persian arrows that will darken the sun. Our arrows will blot out the sun. And the Spartans scoff and say, then we will fight in the shade. They loved coming out with these really swift, really cute put downs. When Leonidas is fighting at the Battle of Thermopylae, the Persian emperor asks the Spartans to put down their weapons. Spartans! Lay down your weapons! And Leonidas says, hey, just come and get them from us. He goes, Molon la bay. It's a great moment. Persians! Come and get them! All of these things not only are in the film to appeal to a modern audience, but they're in the histories of Herodotus to appeal to an ancient reader because we have that human uh, appreciation for courage and the underdog that transcends time and space. Thermopylae in Greek means the hot gates, and it's a pass in northern Greece. And what's unusual about it is it's only a few hundred yards and then abruptly cascades off into a cliff and in the sea. And what that meant is throughout antiquity, a small number of soldiers could block that pass and force an invader from the north to either make an enormous detour of two or three or four hundred miles, or they'd have to blast their way through a very narrow bottleneck. If you imagine yourself on a Greek battlefield, then essentially you'd have two forces in the re rectangular, shield and spear, each man covering a third of the one next to him. Picture a train wreck, because that's what the battle was like. What was really, really important to them was to defend the man on their left with this shield so that they move together en masse. I mean, it was described um, by contemporary authors as being like some hideous monster that moved as one. In the phalanx, everybody is visibly apparent to everybody else. You can see there's a man on your right, there's a man in front of you, there's a man behind you, you're pushing, you're sweating, you're grunting. And actually, you can imagine that's an incredibly effective way to fight because it's very, very, very difficult to penetrate and very, very difficult to break through that rank. So even though there were tiny numbers of Spartans, they managed to hold their own by sticking in this phalanx, by fighting as one rather than fighting as individuals. It was hideous. They ripped each other to pieces. I believe that in fiction, in cartooning, and in cinema, there's a long and worthy history of stylized violence where, where you get across the idea of it rather than the actual reality. There was no way to tell the story of 300 without it being amazingly brutal. On vase paintings, they showed individual warriors stabbing and slicing, even though we know that that didn't take place nearly as much as mass pushing and stabbing. And they, in the 300, there's something like that where the soldiers fight not always in a phalanx, and they fight individually, and some of their weaponry, the swords, look like they're almost out of a Greek vase painting. They're highly ornate, and of course, the soldiers don't have armor on, to, at least to the full extent. And it's, a, it's another way of trying to convey courage, individual skill, physical excellence. Xerxes surrounded himself with this elite force called the Immortals. Um, and they were known as the Immortals in the Greek world because the Greeks couldn't get their heads around the fact that every time one of them died, another one seemed to pop up in its place. And they actually didn't know whether there was something supernatural or spiritual going on here, or whether there was just such an amazing reserve. The Persian Immortals were called immortal because they never got bigger or smaller. There was always somebody to make up roughly a force of 10,000. But they're the shock troops. The Greeks were very suspicious of the immortals, very troubled by them. Even the Spartans were anxious when they knew that the um, immortals were hitting the field. So I think that's why it's brilliant in the film that the immortals have been represented as these kind of strange demonic figures, because in the heads of the Greeks who were fighting that day, that is how they would have seemed to them. If you said the immortals were these soulless creatures, they were demons, you see a monster, you don't see you know, a Spartan doesn't go, oh, so you, when you say demon, you mean like a really angry guy. When the Persian immortals meet the best of the Greek hoplites, that is the Spartan 300, the royal guard and their king, what's going to happen? And you think there's going to be some suspense, but there's no suspense because 
turns out that a Spartan hoplite is far superior even given his reduced numbers. I think as a classicist and ancient historian, when we look at modern adaptations of what we think happened, or at least the sanctity of ancient texts say what happens, and we want to be purist, we would like every single thing in Herodotus to be there, and there's not in Herodotus a rhinoceros, and there would not be a rhinoceros. But as critics, we're also supposed to be critics of literature, then we're trying to say to ourselves, why wouldn't a rhinoceros be there? It represents savagery, ferocity, something foreign, evil, incomprehensible. And so the filmmaker decides to use these conventions in the way he feels fit. We don't actually know that much about Ephialtes in real historical terms. We know that he was a local, and we know that he was somebody who went over to the Persians. But he quickly became demonized by history, so it's no surprise in a way that he ends up in the film as this kind of embittered hunchback. Ephialtes was generally known just to be a shepherd. I turned him into a hunchback because I wanted to stress just how rough the Spartans were and, and how he shouldn't have survived, I mean, by, by Spartan law. And his parents got him away into the mountains, but he always wanted to be a Spartan. I wanted him to be a pathetic figure. And often in cartooning, you make someone's physicality a metaphor for their interior reality. That's something that the screenwriters and writers have tried to draw out of Herodotus. In Herodotus, we really don't get that degree of information. We're just told that Ephialtes was a traitor and was given financial rewards by the Persians for showing him the route around the back of the pass. And of course, this is where the trouble really begins, because it means that the Persians can go up along the path and get round behind the back of Leonidas and his troops, which is a big problem. Why do they do that? They all have to have personal motivations or they want to become enriched because no Greek in his right mind would give up freedom uh, for autocracy. In fact, that was something that happened a lot of the time. You know, the Greeks were half in love with the Persians. These, these were the big boys. These were the boys with the, the money and the big troops. Um, and half of the Greeks thought it was a very good idea to kind of lay down and, and go over and be taken over by the Persian Empire. Um, so the fact that Ephialtes represents this kind of Judas figure, the Greek who was a traitor, the, the Greek who medized is, is how they talked about it in the ancient world, a Greek who went over to the Persians, was very, very significant. May you live forever. To a Spartan, that's the ultimate insult because, you know, the Spartan aesthetic of death is to die on the battlefield. The greatest glory you can achieve in your life is to do that. And not only will he never be able to achieve that great glory that the Spartans can achieve, but he also will have to live with the knowledge of his betrayal forever. What is really incredible about the Battle of Thermopylae is actually that the Spartans lose. I mean, this is a defeat for the Greeks, but very quickly it goes down in popular legend as a victory, as a moral victory. Herodotus describes Thermopylae as a catastrophe, but Herodotus had a very Athenian point of view, and I believe that we wouldn't have had a Plataea or a Salamis without Thermopylae by humiliating the Persians to the point where Xerxes had Leonidas beheaded and put his head on a stake, and the Persians skulked by, still scared of him. It rallied the Greeks. It made them realize what they were. And it is no coincidence that a year later, uh, at the Battle of Plataea, the Greeks win because they've been buoyed up by this notion that the Greeks are capable of anything. This became the most important event in Greek history. So Thermopylae became a legend almost before it became history.